Right, Father, our glorious, glorious Father, we thank you. We thank you in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus, whom we are in perfect union with for the, for the, uh, for the opportunity to congregate as, as sons, to congregate as your family members, to congregate as members of your government, to actually come into clearer understanding, to acknowledge what you have done in us in Christ, and to reason what you have, what your spirit would like us to reason, to come into clear understanding as to the mechanics of what you have done. Father, we commend this session into your hands. In the Lordship of King Jesus, I release light and life into this session, into every participant of this session. Illumination of the understanding. And in the name of Jesus, I decree total and immediate destruction to any Hindu demonic hindrance, any obstacle, any interference of the devil in this session. I command all princes of darkness to stand down, to, 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 to back off of this session. And Father, we thank you for your, for your presence of our holy angels to, to, to stand as the watchmen. We thank you again for this session. And without further ado, Holy Spirit, this is all yours. All right, so pleasant night to everyone. Amen, sorry. <laughs> um, pleasant night to everyone. For those of you who, may, who have not met me before, my name is Zane Pierre. Mentors here at Adventism Identity. And welcome to our first session out of our weekly series. This is actually six chapters of Ephesians, so it will equate six weeks. Every every um, Tuesday afternoon around this time, we would actually chat. We would we would divulge into a chapter. <coughs> right, so I'm coming from you, coming to you all once again from the from the islands of between islands of Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. In the Caribbean, right, and accompanying me on this session here tonight, as with respect to the basic identity, Adrian is here. And she would actually be assisting me with posting the respective excerpts of the Bible. And Kelly Kay is also on, so she would be monitoring the chat window to ensure that whatever questions that may be posted, um, that I don't bypass them, so that we would address everyone's questions and concerns. All right. One second. All right. Sorry about that. I just had to actually make some minor adjustments here. Lovely. So, I trust that well, in the session description, we posted two links that I hope everyone had the opportunity to take a look at. Um, one was on the topic of the Messiah, actually explaining what the Messiah really is, what, what, when we say Christ is in us, and that Christ being the Greek translation of the word Messiah, we see that we are not actually saying that... Uh, Christ is Jesus' last name, as some, um, some, some, some tend to, to assume. But the word, the word Christ is actually a title, that is Messiah, and that is actually referring to the delivering king. So when we say Jesus Christ, what we're actually saying is Jesus the king. Right? And we also, as throughout our, um, for those of you who were in the identity, basic identity sessions, we cover that we are in Christ. So what we are, um, we are in perfect union with that name, that title, that position. And the second one is actually a synopsis on the book of Ephesians. Before we actually dive in, into the book of Ephesians here tonight, I would like to add to the synopsis of that video put together so adequately by Bible Project. Right? For those of you who, just as we were saying just now, for those of you who may be looking for some media, some some assistance with respect to your study of the Bible, I highly endorse Bible the, uh, the Bible Project. They are excellent with respect to the presentation of the information, as well as I can corroborate with my personal studies. They are very a lot 
well, a lot more accurate than most that I've come across so far with respect to contextual understanding. Right, so, to add to the synopsis, I would like to, 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 to first establish a very important fact here before we divulge into the book of Ephesians. Um, as saints in Christ, my dear brothers and dear sisters, it is very important that we make it explicitly clear that life in Christ, being a follower of Christ Jesus, becoming a son of God, has absolutely, and now I know these, these statements here may, for, for, um, I, for most of us here actually, in, in common mind with, with respect to walking in Christ, but for some, these statements might be a bit ruffling, if it does. But it is, I, I, well, what we're seeing here is actually, it is what it is. Right? Life in Christ, being a follower of Christ Jesus, becoming a son of God has absolutely no relation to religion. It's very important that we establish this from the get-go with respect to the to the um, to the book of Ephesians to, 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 to Paul's letters. It would be extremely erroneous to even hint in the slightest that the Apostle Paul's message was in any way religious in nature. Um, a, a religion, according to the dictionary, and to be more specific, we're looking at Miriam Webster dictionary, is in fact defined as one, the belief in a God. Thank you, Adrian. In a God or in a group of gods, as you see there. An organized system of beliefs, ceremonies, and rules used to worship a God or a group of gods. And the last, an interest, a belief, one activity that is very important to a person or group. Now, we all, excuse me, we all act, uh, acknowledge that we are, uh, that we believe in God. And that we are sons of God, as we, but that in no way actually make um, our life in Christ religious per se. As we divulge into the Apostle Paul's letters, as we will see in our study of Ephesians today and the other five sessions ahead of us, our basic study of Ephesians that Paul's teaching of the good news was not in any form or fashion related to anything remotely connected to a religion. The Apostle Paul lived in an age of an empire that was pluralist. And he lived in the age of the Roman Empire. Now, the, the Rome in themselves served many gods. They had thousands of gods. And as far as their conquests led, Rome had a tendency to incorporate the religions of their captives into their respective society. So they, they had a nice little concoction of religious practices. Rome was very friendly to religions. What the Roman Empire was not, was not at all friendly with was in fact the threat of a rival and formidable kingdom that would actually come conquering them. A kingdom that would bring them to their knees. Paul did not preach religion, but he did herald the authority and awe of a new kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord and King Jesus. It was because of this that Paul was arrested and kept under surveillance. And you all remember, well, everyone here would remember when Paul was actually arrested and placed under house arrest. Yeah, nicely. That had nothing to do with religion. Paul actually was preaching the, the arrival and the establishment of a new kingdom. And that made Rome very fearful. As world, uh, uh, world power, the empire that ruled the world at that point in time, they became a bit um, cautious. Even when Jesus was born, the attempt to take his life had nothing to do with religion. In fact, when Jesus was around, Judea was under the dominion of the Roman Empire, and under their authority, Rome allowed the Judeans, well, the persons that we refer to, 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 to today as Jews, to continue comfortably with their ritualistic practices and traditions. Religion was not the issue. Rome was not threatened by religion and their respective gods. What drove the leaders to see the life of Jesus as a child was the prophecy that he was delivering king of the Jews. Right? If we take a look at uh, Matthew, I just posted it in the chat window, you can follow as we read. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Herod the great, the 
Magi or the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with, um, and all Jerusalem with him. So he called prophets. Sorry, sorry. My bad. So he called together all the chief priests and scribes of the people and anxiously asked them where the Christ, brackets the Messiah, the anointed king, was to be born. They replied to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet Micah. Prophet Micah wrote, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not in any way least among the leaders of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And Herod secretly sent to the Magi and, and learned from them the exact time the star had first appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing, after hearing the king, they went their way, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them, continually leading the way until it came and stood over the place where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And after opening their treasure chest, they opened, they presented him gifts fit for a king. Notice the use of the terminology king here. Gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned, of, warned by God in a dream not to go back to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Uh, verse 13 goes on to say, Now when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and, and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod intends to search for the child in order to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left to Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Hosea. He, he said, Out of Egypt I called my son. Right, then Herod, when he realized that he had been tricked by the Magi, was extremely angry, and he sent soldiers and put to death all the male children in Bethlehem, and all and all that area who were two years old and under, according to the date which he had learned from the Magi. And when he had spoken through Jeremiah the prophet, then what had been spoken to Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Jeremiah wrote, A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and came into the land of, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of the father Herod the Great, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he left the region of Galilee and went and, and went and settled in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken to the prophets. The prophets said that he shall be called a Nazarene. Now you see in that excerpt there that there is no reference to this being a religious matter. Right? Herod, the Roman ruler at that point in time, was not concerned with, was not actually concerned with um, religious matters what he was concerned about was the jesus actually being referred to as the king of the jews so they were very cautious with respect to that matter in particular because as the roman empire ruled the world they had it, some insecurities with respect to kings that would come up and prophecies of kings that would threaten their rulership throughout the world yes exactly government and that is exactly where we're heading here, Diana. So to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to accept him as your Lord, is in no way a religious affair. I dare say it is a legal and political affair. You are now governmental officials. All of the terminologies that, you use, that are used in the Bible are not religious, but governmental. If you take a look to, at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it says it in very plain words. There we have it. It says in verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 9, For to us a child shall be born, to us a son shall be given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, 
that is a governmental term, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, for those of you who may be actually researching this, these um, this this who may have researched this scripture, you may have actually um, come into contact with the fact that these terms here are not as we as we as I am reiterating, not religious in nature, but all governmental in nature. I actually included here the, a translator's note. This is actually one of the translators of the New English translation. They included this note here and it actually said that the title Prince of Peace pictures the king as one who establishes a safe socio-economic environment for his people. It hardly depicts him as a meek individual for he establishes peace through military strength as the preceding context and the full two royal titles indicate. His people experience safety and prosperity because the invincible kings the invincible king destroys their enemies. And if you take a look at the word peace in the Bible, it, it actually refers to um, not, not only mental peace, but prosperity, healing, the elimination of all forms of oppression. Verse so 7 goes on to say, There shall be no end to the increase of his government and of peace. He shall rule on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. For from that time forward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, the word hosts can also be translated the angel armies. So the Lord of the angelic military will accomplish this. Everybody following so far? So we see here as we as we are proceeding that this is all governmental affairs, nicely. Now, we are speaking about government, so let's start with definition. As you notice through these sessions, our reference points are usually, are usually biblical contexts and definitions. Now, the word government, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, I've taken out six definitions here that we, can, that we can use as reference points. The first, find as the office, authority, or function of functioning of or function of governing the term during which a governing official holds office secondly the continuous exercise of authority is that word familiar to you all authority in Christ authority over and the performance of function from a political unit to rule three the organization machinery or agency to which a political unit exercises authority and performs functions and which is usually classified according to the distribution of power within it. For the complex of political institutions, laws, and customs through which the functioning, function of governing is carried out. Five, the body of persons that constitutes the governing authority of a political unit or organization, such as the officials comprising the government governing body of a political unit and constituting the organizations as an active agency. And the last, the executive branch of well, in this case, the U.S. federal government, like a small group of persons holding simultaneously the principal political executive powers of a nation or other political unit and being responsible for the, for the direction and supervision of public affairs, right? As I will zero in on, on number two, administration. Now, how, how many of us know that the word, even the word church that we use in the Christian community is is usually used outside of its context and right? the word church as we know it and have used it is actually translation of the Greek word ecclesia e double k l e s i a or to be more accurate ecclesia right if you took up the if you actually look up the word meaning of the word church the translation it is referred to as something religious but the word ecclesia actually exists in the dictionary so did you kindly put up that definition for me, please? And according to the to the Strong's Concordance, the word ecclesia means a calling out, a popular meeting, especially a religious congregation, and so on. And in the English dictionary, Miriam Webster, ecclesia is defined as the political assembly of citizens of ancient Greek states. So when we say church, in its governmental context, what it actually refers to 
is the assembly of citizens. We all remember that the Bible actually refers to us as citizens of the kingdom. Yes, everybody following? We are citizens of the kingdom. So when we say church, we are actually speaking about the assembly of citizens. Right? So this basic Bible study of Ephesians, I just took a moment to set the pace for the study. This, Bible, this basic Bible study, saints and fellow citizens of the state of heaven, is not in any way to is not in any way religious. We will be studying here from the governmental perspective, political and legal perspective. Right? So I trust that, um, we, as I said, you all took a look at the, the the synopsis of Ephesians, and that you also may have read Ephesians chapter one today. So I wouldn't bother to actually read the entire chapter. We will be reading and analyzing as we go along. Right? So. We start at chapter at verse one. Right? We are using the Amplified Bible to read along the chapter. We start at verse one. Um, Adrian, can you read verse one for me, please, if you do me the honors? Yes. Um, all right. Um, Paul, an apostle, a special messenger. You hearing me? Loud and clear. Personally chosen representative of Christ Jesus, the Messiah the anointed by the will of God, that is, by his purpose and choice, to the saints, God's people, who are at Ephesus, and are faithful and loyal and steadfast in Christ Jesus. As um, Diana put it, get everybody to put those thinking cups on. <laughs> All right, so we see here actually Paul refers to, as an, Paul refers to himself as an apostle, special messenger personally chose representative of Christ Jesus the Messiah by the will of God. Right? Now can anyone actually tell me what does the word what is an apostle? Sent one, uh-huh, called one. Or what does it mean? Um to, Diana actually said he called one. Diana I have a question for you to actually get behind that. What does it mean to be called? What is a calling? Follower? Anybody else? A mission close close ah job right a call actually that's nice assignment so when you say a called one actually you can actually put it in our modern English that will be that is actually somebody an employed one somebody who has employment representative uh-huh anybody else right let's think let's all think governmental an apostle the Greek word for apostle is actually apos, apostolos. From a governant, from a governmental perspective, because we are in the government, members of the of the government. Yes, John, elected. We're going, we're going, we are going good. Someone was being given a mantle of authority to carry out the work. Nice, Sumi, you're getting very close. I love that. Adrian, we could go ahead and post on 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 the apostle. Right. So the Greek, so the Greek word apostle is actually apostolos. That is a delegate, just as you are actually saying, an ambassador of the gospel, officially a commissioner of Christ. And if you take a look at the, of the, of the definition of the word commissioner, it is defined as the representative, somebody said representative, of the, um, that was I believe John, representative of the governmental authority in a district, province, or other unit often having both judicial and administrative powers. Right, so we're reading that again. The representative of the governmental authority in a district, province, or other unit, often having both judicial and administrative powers. And so as we see with respect to the, for the, the definition of the Greek word apostolos, these powers are what we refer to as miraculous powers. Right? The kingdom of God is supernatural, so all administrative powers are supernatural powers. Right? So that's the meaning of the, meaning of the word apostolos. Also, we refer to, we, I gave you all uh, the, the link on the video for Christ, which is actually the Greek word Christos, which means the Messiah. And the Messiah, as we, as we spoke about earlier on, as you saw in that video, is what we refer to as Christ, meaning the expected king and deliverer of the Jews. So when we say that Christ is in us, what we are actually saying is the king is in us. That immediately places us in political position in the in, in the kingdom of God. Governmental 
governmental position. What about the word will? What does it mean when it actually says by the will of God? What does will mean? Well, the reason why that we are actually going through these these um these definitions because once we actually put them into a, everything into into its correct context, it actually helps you come to a very clear understanding as to where you stand, and of course it makes you more authoritative and more comfortable to actually operate in the administrative force. Then I said desire. Anybody else? By the executive of God. Nice, nice. I like that if uh, that, that, that definition also. Will, what is the will? Keep it coming. The will, intent or purpose. Alright, so the Greek word for will. God's ruling, nicely, capacity. We're getting there. The spoken word of God. All right, spoken word of God. All right, so the Greek word will is actually the word thelema. It is actually defined as a determination. Somebody said choice. You are straight on, on, on you, are, you are right on point. Purpose. And in particular, what we're looking at here is a decree. Complaint. You miss, you miss Courtney's answer as well. Oh, Courtney, right. Sorry about that. Courtney, that's proclamation. Yes, Courtney. That's what we're looking at there. Proclamation. That's legal proclamation. And as a matter of fact, um, Adrian has posted the, the definition from the dictionary. Will here is actually, to be more specific, um, as Diana put it, something desired, a choice or determination of one having authority or power. But to be, to, in, in line with the definition here, we're looking at a part of a summons expressing a royal command. So God's will in Christ is his royal command for you in Christ. Say that, saying that again, God's will in Christ for you is his royal command. It is not something that, as a lot of actually uh, people tend to think, well, God's will might be this today and God's will is like, it might be that tomorrow. And next week he may have a different will. God's will for your life is a royal command. And it, it, it actually does not shift. His goodness is a royal command for you. Everybody following that so far? Lovely. So we see that the will, royal command. Nicely. What about saint? What about the word saint? What does saint mean? What is a saint? We are re Paul constantly refers to us as saints. Uh, called forth, commissioned. Holiness. Yes, Elijah. Elijah is actually closer. The word saint actually means a holy one. Right? The Greek word for saint is actually hagios. That means sacred, pure, morally blameless, and ceremonially consecrated, set apart. Yes, John. Let's, let's take a look at that again. It means sacred. That, mean, that, that sacred also means holy. Holy. Uh, uh, is also um, referenced as being set apart. As you see in the brackets of that definition, it means pure, morally blameless or religious. Well, we know that this is not religious here, so morally blameless, ceremonially clean, and consecrated. I would like actually to go into a little more definition here with respect to holiness. Um, I, I, that I will lightly touch here as we as we proceed. But in the upcoming session with respect to uh, basic identity 2, that is actually the topic of basic identity 2, which is holiness. And that we will go into a lot more detail. But the, the scene here is actually referred to as a, as a sacred, sanctified one, a holy one, to, to, to be more exact. And if you take a look at Ephesians chapter 2, which we will cover next week, a saint is also referred to as a, as the, well, the Bible says that we are fellow citizens with the saints. If you took a look at that in its governmental context, you look at that in government in its governmental context, it actually alludes to the fact that just as the citizen of the United States will refer to will be referred to as an American, the citizen of Trinidad will be referred to as a Trinidadian. The citizens of England will be referred to as English. The citizens of the kingdom are referred to as saints. Did everybody get that? 
the citizens of the kingdom are referred to as saints, right? Which is actually the holy one. So if 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 the citizens of the kingdom are referred to as saints, can we, which is actually holy ones, we are holy, can we become unholy at any point in time? Nope. Let me put it like this. If the citizens of the United of the of the Kingdom of God are referred to as saints, then to say that someone is um well, let me take it from a different angle. Even even in your country of, of your region, your respective countries, criminals, persons who actually contravene the law, what the law would define as criminals, uh, when they commit their offenses, they are fined or they may be even actually put into prison. Does anyone lose citizenship? By criminal activities. No, they don't. If in this case, the citizens of the kingdom are saints, are holy ones, just as someone as, as in, in Christ, if you make mistakes, does that change your citizenship? No, it does not. So, your holiness in Christ is actually a statal status. Everybody, everybody following that? Say that again. Your holiness in Christ is in fact a legal status, a statal status. Jesus, Jesus is sacrificed, cleared you of all liabilities, making that permanent for you. Lovely. So as we as we see that, so now we understand and we read Paul, an apostle, commissioned a commissioned one of the kingdom, with a legal mandate, special messenger, personally chosen representative of Christ Jesus the Messiah by the will of God, by the royal command of God, that is, by his purpose and choice, to the saints, the holy ones, God's people, just as God is holy, so we are holy in Christ, who are Ephesus and faithful and loyal and steadfast in King Jesus. Does that bring clear understanding to that verse? Everybody following? Nicely. So we see here that these things, what is what 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 God has done, it's all le it's all legal. You cannot change it. No one can change it. And if you can't change it in, in the in the states of the earth, the countries that you live in, you cannot change it in the kingdom. Verse two. Would someone read verse two for me, please? Verse okay. Two. Uh huh. Okay, I've got it. Uh, verse two is grace to you and peace inner calm and spiritual well-being, in brackets, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amplified. Nice. Thank you, John. So question, what is grace? You see, once we actually identify these things in definitions, we reason it, these things become very clear. It's a lot easier to walk in the administrative, the miraculous administrative powers. Grace, inner peace. Uh-huh. Anybody else? What is grace? Power. Mm, yes, but that's not, in, not the definition we're looking for right now, Courtney. The spirit of grace is the spirit of power. So yes, you are technically correct, but according to the context here, we're speaking about grace to you and peace. So what exactly is grace? Looking past another's wrongs. Mm -hmm. Getting somewhere we don't deserve. That's, that is correct. Um, but with respect to, now let's, now let's actually guide it to the legal perspective, governmental perspective. What would grace be in a state? Right, so in a governmental perspective, pardon, lovely, ability, allowing freedom, nicely, favor. Right, so legally, well, the, before we actually look at that, the, the word grace, translated grace in the Bible is actually the Greek word charis. It actually means graciousness of manner or act, especially the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life, including gratitude. Grace in the dictionary, Merriam-Webster dictionary again, actually means privilege. From a legal perspective, it means privilege. The word privilege is defined as following. Dejan, we went and put up privilege, um, definition of privilege. Right. Grace also means unmerited divine assistance, the unmerited divine assistance given humans for their regeneration or sanctification. Grace is also defined as a virtue coming from God, 
and a state of sanctification enjoyed through divine assistance. Privilege, as we said, is defined as a right, a license, not well, or exemption from duty or liability granted as a special benefit, advantage, or favor. It is an exemption from liability when action is deemed to be justifiable, as in the case of self-defense, or because of the requirements of a position or office. So let me say that again. Grace is actually defined also, apart from unmerited divine assistance, it is also defined as privilege. So if you receive grace in the state, you have received a privilege, and that privilege is an exemption from liability. Does that make sense to anyone? Yeah? So you are pardoned. You are no longer facing liabilities, the liabilities of, in this case, what we refer to as uh, sin. Right? As we go along, in Ephesians, we'd actually see how Jesus actually went about to establish this covenantal grace. And we all, the Bible also, that, that, that verse also says, Grace to you and peace in a common spiritual well being from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? The, the, what does the word Lord mean? You know, we always, always say, Thank you, Lord. The Lord helped me, the Lord empowered me. But what does the word Lord mean? What is a Lord? What is a Lord? We say Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Define Lord. What is a Lord? Master. A master, caretaker. Uh huh. Anybody else? He missed Courtney again. <laughs> oh my, sorry, Courtney. Once again, ruler. Courtney said ruler. Yes, ruler. But we want to actually, the word Lord is actually still used in the world today but it's usually used in kingdoms such as the united kingdom what does the word lord mean here creator um not exactly diane the, the the creator is also the lord but what we want to identify here is what does lord mean what 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 does that refer to exactly caretaker yes anything else what does lord mean um not exactly john elijah says overseer be a little more specific for me, um, Elijah. Overseer of what? Authoritative figure in what way, Kelly? Of the land. Right? That's why actually when you are renting, you refer to the, the person as a landlord. Right? A lord. I was thinking about the type. Lord in the yes. Owner. Owner of property. Yes, Diana. <laughs> um, not exactly, John. And I'll show you how and why. Um... A lord, according well, uh, the, the Greek word translated as lord is actually kurios, and that means supreme in authority, controller, and just as you all rightfully said, a master, but not master as in a teacher, the title master. So if you look at the dictionary, the, um, the, the definition of, of lord, Adrian, you see that lord here is defined as a ruler, just as somebody said, but to be more specific, a ruler by hereditary right by hereditary right or preeminence to whom service and obedience are due. To be more up to, in a different context, well, this is actually tied in. The law is actually referred to as the owner of land or other real property. Owner of land or other real property. In our modern society, we actually refer to as the owner of the place that you're renting from as your landlord. That's because he's the owner of the real property, as in real estate. Right? So to be a lord in the, for example, in the United Kingdom, that is actually something hereditary. That you're actually the lord because you own property, you owner of land. So when we say Lord Jesus, what we are actually saying is the owner of all. Now, the word a lord is also, in this case, if it is hereditary, the lord is also an heir. Right? So heirs automatically are called lords. So in a kingdom, even here on earth, where we can actually look at the United Kingdom, you'll notice that the children of Queen Elizabeth are actually referred to as lord so-and-so. Everybody ever notice that? So the child's name is Harry. They're referred to as Lord Harry. That's because the heir the throne is actually referred to as Lord. So heir, as you see in the definition posted, is a person who inherits or has a right to inherit property after the death, the, 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 the death of its owner and a person who has legal claim 
to a title. So this is something that you are, you inherit. Now, Disney Bible actually say that we are co-heirs. Disney Bible say that we are co-heirs in the kingdom. Yes. You know, I replied, Zane, but it just keeps doing that little squirrely thing. Like, it doesn't want to take my chat reply. So I'm just letting you know I did reply, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, Kelly. Technically, we are landlords, yes. Landlords of all of creation. All of you. Actually, if you look at Psalm, Psalm 2, you can actually get some information. Psalm 2, it actually calls us um, Lord. You got uh, Father actually, in speaking to his son, said, Ask of me and I'll give you the earth as your personal property. So, yes, we are technically landlords too. So, as co heirs in Christ, we are also referred to as lords. For those of you who may not have come across that before, you can actually refer to Galatians chapter 4. Right? I will post that there for you. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Here we are. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. This is the authorized version that I have here on an application. It says, Now I say that the heir, we are the heirs, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. So with Christ, we are also lords. Everybody seeing that? <laughs> yes, Diana. Um, Kelly, <laughs> we need to do obscene resumes. <laughs> Showing our titles. Well, I guess we can do that. <laughs> all right, so we are also lords. And right? so it is not blasphemous to say, yes, lovely John. You took the words right out of my mouth. Lord John, Lord, Lord Diana, Lord Lord Adrian, Lord Diane, Lord Michael, Lord Sumi. <laughs> In the kingdom, we are all heirs, and so we are by inheritance. As sons of God, we are lords. Right? So it is not blasphemous. Everybody following that? Nice. Is this, is this making sense? Great. Anybody actually ever, anybody, well, just, just, just as, a, as, a, as, a, as a means of, just out of curiosity, we all, we all, we may, most of us have actually read Ephesians one on once. Is it, have you, does this understanding of Ephesians actually help? Yeah, lovely. So the comrades are coming, nice, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, Diana. So the defines, lovely, John. All right, so you see that this, this here has been, the, the book, Paul's letters in particular, and as we're doing Ephesians, is rich. It's rich once you understand its context. It's governmental perspective. You notice that hey, this thing is very heavy. Nicely. So verse 3. Would somebody else read verse 3 for me, please? We are royalty, Kelke. We are royalty, supernatural royalty. Anybody, verse 3. Anybody that, that hasn't read, read down so far? Verse 3. Uh -huh. All right, so I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Oh, and this just here, that, sorry, 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 <laughs> my bad, sorry. You want me just, to continue, or you want to go ahead? That's what's three. That's what's three for now. Oh, okay. I didn't see the little forty. Right, so verse 3, blessed and worthy of praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Thank you very much, John. With every spiritual blessing, you have in in Christ. Now, this verse here has a few things that you need to take into consideration. It, you cannot, you, you miss this. It actually contributes tremendously to the rest of this book. To, to, to the, rest of this book. Um, the word blessed, what does it mean to be blessed? What does it mean to be blessed, favored? Keep, keep it coming, that's, that's good. Empowered. All right. Now, it actually says, blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this blessed here is actually related to Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. To have something bestowed, favor and abundance. Uh, okay, okay. Keep it coming. Blessed and worthy of praise. Blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To have something bestowed. Okay. To be envied. Lovely. I, lo I, I like that um, definition also, John. But the word blessed actually is the Greek word eulogito, um, eulogitos, which actually means adorable or adored. The dictionary would 
the, 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 the contextual definition of that in the Merriam-Webster dictionary actually is holy. Right? So when we say blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are, we are actually saying also holy be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word holy is very rich. I said I can't, I, to, to, to actually divulge into holiness would take some time. But holiness here means, as we say, sacred, blessed. Yeah. So when we say that we have the Holy Spirit, what are we say? We have the spirit of blessings. Yeah. It's interchangeable. We are we actually we have the blessed spirit. <laughs> right. So blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit. If you look at Romans, actually Romans and Hebrews, Hebrews in particular. That is Hebrews chapter. I don't know the chapter at the moment, but actually Hebrews and Romans refer to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Grace. The one that actually establishes the blessings in, in the saint's life. How many of us knew that? Just by having the Holy Spirit, you have the Spirit of Blessings. Nice. So when we say blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, 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 John. Blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of uh, the, the Holy Spirit that we have is actually the spirit of our Father. So when we say blessed and worthy of praise be the one and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can also say blessed and worthy of praise be the sons that actually have the same spirit. Right? But we won't divulge into that here also. Blessed and worthy of praise be the one and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed being holy, holy being exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. Blessed also in the definition posted also means enjoying happiness. Let's say that again. Blessed also means enjoying happiness. So when we say we have the Holy Spirit, we have the spirit of enjoying happiness. Is this is this resonating? So when we have the Holy Spirit, trust me, if you actually take a look at what holiness is, you may have been missing out on a lot of what you really have. Yeah? It actually goes on to say in verse 3, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. The word blessed there is actually a variation of the Greek word euolitos. It actually is the Greek word eulogeo. Did you can you post that please? Again, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Yeah, so when we say bless, eulogeo in that, in that context means to speak well of. To bless, to thank or invoke a benediction upon, to prosper. The word bless also means to praise and to glorify in that context. To praise spoken or written words about the good qualities of someone or something. An expression of approval for someone or something. This actually says that we, the saints in Christ, are approved. Never unapproved. By royal commands, we are approved. It also means to glorify, especially by the attribution of perfections. Now that's going to ruffle a lot of people's um, theology. And, to, and the word glorify, it means to make glorious by bestowing honor, praise, or admir admiration. To elevate to celestial glory. To uh, as you see there, the word approve also means to have or express a favorable opinion of. Specifically, look at the last one, to accept as satisfactory. Since, look at yourself here and, see, and, actually, and acknowledge that in the kingdom of God, you are satisfactory. You are in no way defective despite the mistakes of your soul. You are in no way defective. You are approved. It says that Father has blessed you, he's spoken well of you, and you have every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Right? So you are blessed, you are approved. The word blessing also refers, as you say, approval that allows or helps you to do something. That's spiritual blessing. So if we took a look at the first blessing, which was Eulogetos, second, who has blessed us, which is Eulogeo, and the third, which is spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms in Christ, is another variation, which is eulogia. Eulogia. That means blessing. 
which is fine speaking, elegance of language, commendation, as in a eulogy, what we call in English a eulogy, right? Reverentially, reverential adoration. The dictionary's definition of that, of that in particular, is approval that allows or helps you to do some help and approval from God and something that helps you or brings happiness. Are we getting the picture? Yeah, are we getting the picture? Lovely. Nicely. Now, the next thing that we would actually need to highlight here, there's two things that I would like to emphasize. It actually says spiritual blessing. What, in for, some, for those of you who are in the basic identity one session, what in us produces sonship? Pop quiz, yes. <laughs> The spirit. Nice. <laughs> yeah, well, well, uh, consider a pop quiz, John. A pop quiz. <laughs> All right. So, yes, it is the Holy Spirit that produces sonship. So, if we have the Holy Spirit, uh huh. I didn't take it, but guessing Holy Spirit, right? Right. <laughs> so, if the Holy Spirit produces sonship. Wouldn't that mean that we are all, we are actually spirit? Yes. Which means that all, all our blessings are not in any form or fashion rooted in the identity of the soul. So when we say spiritual blessings, how do we actually access the blessings, the spiritual blessings? In the spirit, lovely. So the only way that actually that you're going to that you're actually going to walk in the reality of your spiritual blessings is through the identity of you of the spirit nicely all right so we are sons of god our blessings are accessed solely via our spiritual identity and that is in christ now that that there would actually explain why lots of people actually they read this verse they know they have spiritual blessings but it doesn't they, they don't take note that it actually says spiritual blessings and it is if your if your identity if you have been living a life that where where your identity is rooted in your soul, in your soul, then it is impossible to access that blessing. It must be in the spirit. It also says in the heavenly realms in Christ. That in itself uh, actually says that we are no longer beings of the earthly realm. It says in the heavenly realms in Christ. So if you are in Christ, if you are taking your identity from Christ. Saints, you are actually, right now, wherever you are, living in the earth, in the heavenly realms. Do you know that Psalms 103, verse 22, actually refers to the earth as a region of the kingdom? Let me ask this question again. Are you all aware that in Psalm 103, verse 22, the last verse of that psalm refers to earth as a region of the kingdom? Yes, it is. It does. Yes, this is a region of the kingdom. And so because of Adam's sin, for those in the spirit of Adam, because the kingdom of God is actually in the Holy Spirit, those in Adam are actually in the correct geographical location, but not in the kingdom. Does that make sense? With the absence, I'm saying that again, with the absence of the Holy Spirit, we can be in the correct geographical location, but not living in the realm of the kingdom because the kingdom of god is in the holy spirit according to romans chapter 14. does that make sense excellent lovely so let me say that again eh? it's it's something that you, you always need to take into consideration because if you are taking your identity from the soul as you cover in basic identity one you maybe you are in the geographical location in a region of the kingdom and not living in the kingdom because the holy spirit the kingdom is in the holy spirit according to romans 14. so when we take our identity from the spirit only then are we living in the kingdom of god does that make sense all right actually i would take the liberty of posting that verse for you all, all right that's psalm 103 verse 2 are we actually taking that from the new english translation let me just post that there for you all. all right, Psalm 103 verse 22. Let me post that there for you. New English translation. There we go. It says, Praise the Lord, all that he has made. 
everything he had on earth also is actually what he has made in all the regions of the kingdom. So if earth is what he has made and we, the animals, the earth and its nature is what he has made, then this is also referred, this is also encapsulated as a region of the kingdom. So I'm saying this again, one more time. Those in Adam are actually in the correct geographical location, but not living in the kingdom. This was one of Jesus' accomplishments on the cross. He actually reconnected it by making the Holy Spirit or the new nature available to the sons with the Holy Spirit. Alright, so but let's move on. Nice, verse 4. It says, just as I will take verse 4 here, just as in his love he chose us in Christ, actually actually selected us. Uh, just as in his love, he chose us in, in Christ. Notice he said, notice it says that he chose us in Christ, actually selected us for himself as his own before the foundation of the world, so that we would be holy, consecrated, set apart, purpose driven, and blameless in his sight in love. Right? Jadrian, can you please post the definition of the word holy there from the dictionary? And we, we just mentioned that the word, Greek word holy is high. It says it means exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. Notice he said before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. So we are exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. The word holy actually Again, this is actually going to ruffle a lot of persons' theology. Fine, right? Pete first, in First Peter, the Apostle Peter also says we, we, we share the divine nature. But number three, devoted entirely. Well, that well, that's not the context we're looking at. And having divine quality, and right? so we are holy and blameless. The word blameless there in the Greek actually means unblemished. So question: There's the term. Yes, different from the spot and without blemish in the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Without spot and without blemished, we are blameless, unblemished. Literally or figuratively, we are unblemished. Good. Bro, Just can I can I ask you something? Um, if the, um, the, um, the kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is within us, so we are living in the kingdom of God. Uh, of, uh, we live. We are living in spirit. We're living in the kingdom of God. Um, so, traveling to the to the heavens is that nonsense? Because we are there, traveling in spirit to to heaven. Um. Wow. Then, that's... That sh then that should be nonsense because we are here. You know. Well. I Bro, answer your question. Um, that is an I, I love that question. It's uh, I, I love that that this is actually stimulating thought. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's nonsense. What? Look at it like this: if this if the if this the kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is in us, then if the kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit, then all of creation is actually in us, which actually points to the fact that if we consider the King, the, the Holy Spirit to be nothing short of the volume in which all of creation exists. Let me say that again. If the kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit and the, the, the Holy Spirit is actually in the volume, is, the Holy Spirit is the volume in which all of creation exists, then if the Holy Spirit is given to us and is now our now given to us as our personal spirits, then just as Father is now I know this is going to ruffle some some person's theology, but just as Father by his spirit is omnipresent, then the sons by the same spirit they are all everywhere, anywhere, at all times. To actually say that one is traveling in the spirit technically is to actually have the Adamic perspective of spiritual, your spiritual, spiritual status of the spirit of Adam. 
But the spirit of Adam does not have the Holy Spirit. So when the when the persons in let's say in the New Age and those who do witchcraft or astral travel, they actually travel in the spirit. Literally, they need to do that in the sense that because they are disconnected from the Holy Spirit, they travel the spirit as a creation. So they, they will actually come out of the body and journey. Because the Holy Spirit is technically the volume in which all of creation exists, then the sons of God are actually everywhere at all times. I can, now, I, and I know this would ruffle some people's feathers, it would ruffle a lot of theology. <laughs> I actually am ecstatic to hear that you ask that kind of question because it, it means that you are thinking. This this is this is um, this this exercise is actually proven to be fruitful. That, that we are encouraging intelligent analysis. But I, I, I to be kind, I will say I wouldn't say it's it's nonsense. But technically, it is ignorance to say that the saints are traveling in the spirit. For the saint who understands the, the spiritual, his spiritual sight, as in what the eyes of the human body is to the soul, the eyes of the imagination is to your spiritual identity. Because the Holy Spirit would be the volume in which all of creation exists, I as we are saints, we don't need to travel. All we need to do is desire to see at that location. And the desire enables us to see from any angle, anywhere, from any location, at will. Because we are there, just like Father, we are there anywhere, at any point in time. Yeah, I, I, I would say, not uh, nonsense in the sense... Um, that we cannot travel, but we are already there. We don't have to travel. Yes, we sir. only have to uh, open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts of understanding. And we know, you know, we are already there. We don't have to travel. Um, yes. you are technically. You are that, that, that's what I mean. And um, uh, the ones um, who are actually traveling, they are traveling from the, the the point of the soul yes, you sir. know like like astral travel and those uh, those those things you know um, those people do they are traveling from the soul and then they are in an you know then then they can really travel but we we don't have to travel we we can sit here and but we are there yes sir. already you are perfectly correct I mean. you are perfectly correct and um, an awesome, 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 awesome reasoning. Awesome reasoning. I mean, I wasn't planning to actually touch that topic here in, in, in this session, but yes, that is awesome reason and that is spot on. I can actually attest to actually putting these things into to practice. Not only myself, Yvonne, Adrian, Kelly Key. And if, as a saint, I desire, because of the my understanding and the mechanics of the union with the Spirit of God, if I desire to actually stand up on a particular street in Australia right now, all I need to do is actually first initiate it by the desire and I see because the Spirit of God is anywhere and everywhere. So let, to, to put it like this, yes, yes, I'm in the by faith. To put it like this, let me put it like this. For those who are in Adam without the actual connection with the Holy Spirit, they are on earth for the saints that are connected to the Holy Spirit. We are not on earth. Earth is in us. Does that make sense to anybody? <laughs> okay, lovely. So I say that again. For the saints, where all of the kingdom and creation is in the Holy Spirit, we, being one of the Holy Spirit, are as big as the Holy Spirit. And so we are not on earth as those who are in Adam. Earth is in us. Right? I know that these kind of statements, I am fully aware that my ruffle theology from time to time, time, but I, we are here to discuss truth, and that is what we are going to do. Uh, Zane, can I in, interject something? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> I am. Yes, I am. 
um, the, the thing about this, um, to, to even add to what Zane is saying, for instance, this is something Zane had taught us. And even though you hear it, unless it becomes something that you fully understand, it, it would just be something that, oh, right, wow, and you, you walk off. But when Zane taught it to us, that's how I was. Oh, wow, great, and you walk off. But it did not really make total sense to me. Until I went recently, about two, three weeks ago, into my quiet time with the Lord, and Holy Spirit just made me aware. It was like an epiphany when he began to show me how all of creation is inside of us. And every time you, when you think you're traveling, it's not really you're traveling because when I see things, I see it from a height. Uh, as Kelly had to explain to me, I saw it from an aerial view. So if I'm seeing from an aerial view, it's because it's inside of me and I'm looking down at, at what's taking place. So that, um, I just wanted to, to just add in my portion of it because for some people, um, you would understand, you would have a better understanding when you see Holy Spirit shows you and, and makes it clear to you, you cannot do anything else but run with it. And more and more, I understand this thing that all of creation is in us. I see the mountains. It's like in the, that your core, the core of your being. You see the mountains, you see the trees, you see the rivers, you see everything. And that is what makes it beautiful. Amen. That's just my um, addition to help out anybody else. Thank you, Zane. No problem. Um, I would just like to just pause for a, a, a minute here and just open the floor. Unmute for people since I actually voice their thoughts. If you have any questions, if you have another question, but please feel free to voice your thoughts on what we've been covering so far. Yeah, brother, that's, that's why it is for, for us um, very easy. Uh, for example, like um, a, a, f a phenomenon like uh, remote viewing. Um, we are here and, uh, and I'm, I'm viewing um, Linda, for example, or Sumi, you know, I want to, I, I, I like to... Uh, to see them um, and from from my standpoint, and I'm 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 here uh, I'm I'm sitting here in the spirit, and I I like to to see them. I I can see them, you know, I, I, uh, at will or at desire. I can do that because I'm in the spirit. But uh, I notice that many or you know Christians uh, think they they have to travel in the spirit, go out of their body, you know, and then uh, go into heavens to to be there with the lord or to be you know but it is it is it is not necessary because we are part of this spiritual nature you know so we are there already yes 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 bro yes yes you are spot on <laughs> you are there you are you are there you there's actually no need um for those who actually say traveling in the spirit, I understand what they're trying to say, but the reality of the of of the on the, of the uh, what Christ has done is that we are there, we are all over at will. My Father has actually given us His Spirit, and by faith, as as Linda put it, yes, by faith, at will, we can be there. I I personally can attest to the fact that through understanding this in a moment I could actually be at this room just just by the first inclination of desiring to see Father I'm at this room and we can have conversations in the spirit so is there's no in Christ what actually what 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 would help tie in for those of you who may be struggling with this or not too sure the Bible says in Colossians that all things consist in Christ. He says it again, the Bible says all things consist in Christ. And if Christ has become you, then as I just said, you are not on earth 
this galaxy you are not in this galaxy this galaxy is in you anybody else anybody else just, just come in so that i have a question then so the earth is in us so does that go back to government is that talking about so the earth needed to be in us because then we're talking about ruling and power and authority again yes yes courtney that is that is that is that is spot on right actually once See, just as Father governs all of creation, and He is the governing, but they have the governing head with everything in Him. So, as sons, He's put everything in us, so that we actually can govern. So, where where everything is in us, there is no external force for the obedience of creation, and even the obedience of the devil. There is no external force. He has to obey. Because the kingdom is in us. A anybody else? Just feel free to unmute. Um, Michael posted as well, Jane. You can check it out. Oh, Michael said, we, if we are seated in Christ Jesus in the heavenlies and Jesus is everywhere, then we would be everywhere. That is true. As we're traveling, there's no need in, as Jesus is everywhere. So we are everywhere and we see from the heavenlies. Am I on the right track or am I off? No, sir. You are very much on track. And if Christ, if Christ, is in, if Christ has become us and Christ is um, everywhere, then you are everywhere at all points in time. I believe, um, now I have not been translated from one location. Let me put that as yet. But I believe that understanding this makes it, it's just my opinion here, makes it a lot easier to disappear and appear from one location to, to the other, just as Jesus did by understanding that this is all in, in us and actually to move from one location to the next is by mere thought of desiring to be in what is in you already. <laughs> I, would, uh, I wouldn't deviate with, with, with that in particular, but Michael, yes, you are spot on, sir. Um, the answer that is with the throne of God, lay hands on people from far away. Yes, yes, ma'am. Very, very correct. So, Zane, I have a quick question then. Um, and, and a comment, too. Uh, look, I'll do my comment first, and then I'll ask you the question so I can just mute and listen. But So my comment would be, then, as far as, um, like, say, the prophetic, because we have the mind of Christ. So every word that's ever going to be given for anybody, we have it. That's why we can expect when we ask the Lord or, you know, think about the mind of Christ for someone, we are going to get a word. We, we can't not get one because it's all in there. Is, is that, you know, does that make sense? Does that seem reasonable with what we're saying here? Uh, and then my question is, um, you talk about traveling to the throne, you know, to discuss things with Father God. And if he's in us, if, if Daddy's in us, what is the benefit of traveling to talk to him? Um, Diana, what, 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 what was the question? If, if, if travel, say that again, please, thanks. Okay, so you, you talked about, tra you know, at any time we can just be with, with Daddy in the throne room. And I do this. I'm just there. I'm in his lap. I'm just getting comfort from him. If he's already in us, you know what I mean? If it's already all in us, what is the benefit of doing that, of kind of um, making the intention, I guess, of our heart to go and be with him when we know he is with us? Does that, does that make sense? That, that actually makes perfect sense. Um, I actually, I wouldn't, how do I put, how do I turn that? What I would say actually, it's the same thing that you're looking at there, but if you look at it, look at it through understanding this, the perspective of doing the same thing is different in the sense that when we go, when we desire to spend time with Father, that is actually um, not that we need to go there because we are always there with Father. What we actually at that point in time is, in essence, focusing on the relational aspect of your connection with Father. It's, it is nothing more than the relational aspect, the fellowship with Him. You, um, you are there at all times, but it's a different thing when you desire to actually dedicate your fellowship to to father to actually to actually um what is the word i'm looking for to to 
build the, or sh I, well, I can't say build because in Christ you have a relationship that has existed for eternity, but what you're doing is actually directing your attention to Father directly. That's what I want to say. So would it be like a different facet of our relationship, like say in a marriage, you know, you do different things with your spouse, you have different, um, you could go out and do a hobby with them or you can stay home and read, you know what I mean? Like a different facet? Yes, I okay. would say that because you have a spouse and you could actually be in the house with the spouse day in, day out. But there is a difference when you actually sit down and want to actually spend time with them to direct your attention to them. You're always in the presence. You're not going anywhere. You're, you're like each, in each other's presence. But there's another facet of the existence where you, just as you need to actually direct your attention to another soul to build a relationship with Father, you're not really building a relationship because the Word of God has been with Father, so you've inherited a relationship that has an eternity of cultivation. But you're actually focusing on your connection with Father. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. And, you know, the the truth is that I have that same type of different connection with each one of the Godhead. So when I, at certain times I connect with Holy Spirit and we do, usually it's Bible study or when we travel, I feel very connected to him. But then with Jesus, he he shows me things. He just says, you know, come away. I want to talk to you. And then I'm just... I'm in this particular field by this particular house that, we, you know, we sit on the porch and we just chat. And yet I know I have Jesus in me at all times, but at this time, you know, these certain times, it's like a set apart time. It is so, it is so special. It is so intimate. So I just want to, you know, I guess verify that that is a true um, yeah. area of relationship. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And with respect to what you said concerning the prophetic, I will actually give you a testimony, a personal testimony. If all of creation is in Christ, and Christ existed long before creation, long before space and time, then listen to this carefully. Yeah? Christ being in you is actually to have all history of eternity and all future eternity in, in you, in your mind. So what you have is the all space and time in actually your mind as in the mind of Christ. I experienced this personally. It's just, just a personal testimony. I, I don't really divulge too much into that, in, into these things. Um, I'm very careful with respect to who I'm sharing these things to because most people don't understand this as, as we are discussing it here. But there was um, in 2016, early 2016, where I, out, just out of curiosity, stepping into this understanding and knowing that I have the, 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 the knowledge of Christ, past, present, and future in me, I actually requested our Father. I said, Father, I would like to see when this earth was created. This is just, uh, this is just curiosity. And I fell asleep um, that same night and literally was in the spirit and saw standing in the midst of space where I saw planets around me, um, meteor uh, meteorites, asteroids and things like that floating around me. And I heard Jesus' voice. And he's, uh, actually, I, 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 was, I was able to witness because of, not that it was something outside, it's because it is actually in Jesus' memory. And so what he did was take me back to that memory where he that point in time, that space, point of space and time, where he spoke the earth into existence, he actually said, earth exists, and I saw a little spark, and I heard him say that he called those, he called those things that are not as if they were, and I saw a little spark in the midst of a big open space, and I literally witnessed the formation of the earth, and that actually confirmed a lot. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, I'm muted. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. It really does. And um, no, you know what? You answer my question. So I'm going to let you answer someone else's. I think Sumi has a question. Thank you. No problem. Sumi. Azim, I have a question. Um, so we talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, we talk about, um, you know, all of creation being within us. 
And when we talk about all of creation, we're talking about um, heaven. And we're also talking about hell as well. Is, would that be right? Wow, I love these questions. I love these questions. These people are thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, Sumi, um, to actually go into hell and Satan right now is going to actually take away tremendously from this. I think that what we need to do is actually create a separate session to discuss this aspect of it. But to respond to your question, yes, and to go further, if you understand that in Adam, what we know, the, 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 the topic of hell in, in the Gospels has a particular context that cannot be confused. Um, just to lightly touch on it, when Jesus spoke about hell in the, in the Gospels, we must take into consideration the context of what Jesus did was actually, remember, Jesus came here to not pretty much to fulfill Moses' prophecy, that, the, that, that which is actually way in Deuteronomy. He prophesied that Israel in particular, and this is why he told the, gen, the, the disciples not to go to the Gentile nations. He particularly told them to stay here because he sent, he sent to Israel. And he was fulfilling a prophecy, actually, to pronounce national judgment on Israel. And the term hell, if you actually go and look at it in the in the concordance, it actually refers to the Valley of Hinnom. Not too long after that, when he left in AD 70, there was the persecution of the Jews, where in the Valley of Hinnom they burnt millions of Jews. It was not that that was the context of that. Uh, um, that is not to negate that there is a location where fallen angels are bound and so on. But that was the context of what he was speaking about in the in the in, in the gospels, and that is a separate topic. As I said, that in itself ruffles a lot of theology for for most people. Hell also, in particular, um, if you read to James, James chapter two, he actually speaks about before James. James is written in the, in fifty A.D., and Paul came out in his revelation fourteen years after in sixty four A.D. He actually came up with the revelation of the mystery. I'm trying to do this as quickly as possible, so we don't spend too much time on this. But um, in 64 AD, he came up with the revelation. He, he made the revelation known that Christ was in us. Before that, in 50 AD, the disciples actually were operating on Jesus' teachings, and they knew that they received the Holy Spirit, but did not know that there was a transition of the new nature in particular, and so James in chapter 2 actually says that the tongue is actually set on fire by hell, which actually indicates that the, to actually have the spirit of Adam, hell is in that case is a spiritual state and not only a physical location. Apart from all of that, the, the need, the actual, if you actually, if you cover the, 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 the topic of Satan, you now many Christians are actually of the opinion that Satan is this big enemy of God and things like that, the Bible begs to differ in the sense that yes, he is actually doing things that are contrary to the nature of God, but he actually play the, plays the role in creation as the accuser of the brethren, as the adversary. Adversary is also another legal terminology that means the prosecuting angel. That is, a, that is actually a court term, the adversary. So he was actually the one prosecuting those in the Old Testament. That is why he was actually in the kingdom and accusing people like Job, because that was his job to accuse and to, to, to issue God's judgment. If you look at the Old Testament, even in the book of Kings and so on, you'll find that actually, they, even with respect to Saul, the Bible said that evil spirits came from God and actually and dealt with Saul. So yes, even Satan is in the kingdom, but the context that the Christian church generally has of Satan is not very accurate, I might say. They actually um, look at him as the person that's actually doing them something. The Bible says that all princes or principalities have actually been brought into subjection to Christ and that he stripped them of their power, even the accuser, by removing the law. And that is actually why in Romans chapter, Revelation chapter 10, it says the accuser has been cast down. That is a huge topic, Sumi, but to answer, to answer yes, that also that, and, and that is also there, and it is actually there for us even of, of, uh, with respect to the princes of darkness and so on, to govern them. Does that make sense? I know I kind of spoke quickly there because I didn't want to actually take away from the session here, but does that make sense? Yes, okay. Lane. Thank you. Thank you. It does. All right, so we are in a position of governance that actually even Satan must take instructions. 
he is actually one of the princes. And if you look at Daniel chapter 9, it actually refers to Jesus as the prince of princes. So our union with Christ actually gives us the authority of the prince of princes. And if he is the prince of the power of the air, then he must take instructions from us from a military perspective. He has no choice. The bro got to listen. Does that make sense? <laughs> All right. Sorry for the... Also, um, uh -huh. Sorry, Elijah also had a question. Yes, yes, bro. Proceed. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I just wrote here, is it receiving? We have already everything because of the Holy Spirit, and we only have to re receive. Uh -huh. Yeah. Already, like, uh -huh. I, I'm sorry, I was muted, double, double muted. Um, is, you know, uh, we, we are in the spirit. Um, actually, for, for my understanding, you know, I don't have to do anything else than receiving because everything is given unto us in the spirit. Everything in creation is in us, you know. We only have to um, um, receive from our Lord uh, that what is more for us, uh, f for what he has in store for us, for what he has more in store, you know. Uh, everything is already in us. We only have to be, uh, sit here and uh, just say, uh, Lord, give it, give it to me. Give me the, 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 the greater understanding or give me the knowledge of uh, open my eyes, open my ears, uh, um, more so that I can receive more from you and see more from you. We, we, we don't have to do ac um, actually um, anything because everything is already given unto us, you know. Um, so we are already um, whole, you know. We, are, we, we, we have already everything in us. Yes, um, yes. Yes, bro. Actually, Colossians, actually, Colossians chapter 2, I believe, says that we are complete in Christ. I am a verse here from Philemon chapter, from Philemon, that's verse 6. I, I will be a little more accurate with respect to what, what you're saying in the sense that I wouldn't say that you have to receive it because you've received it already. According to Philemon 6, what you have to do is acknowledge it. The saints of God actually walk only in what they acknowledge. That is why it's very important that you say in study and learn Christ. They cannot walk in what they do not acknowledge. If you don't acknowledge that you are blessed, you will live an entire life with great power and great authority over devils, healing the sick and be a pauper. And vice versa. If you if you have if you acknowledge that you are blessed, that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of blessings, you could be a rich guy. And demons will have their way with you. <laughs> But then the, op then, then, then the opposite is all, uh, also true, that when we think we don't have it, then we don't have it. Yes, because sir. we think we don't have it. Exactly. And that is exactly why Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5 says that we need to actually to cast down knowledge that exhausts itself against the knowledge, the true knowledge of God, and to bring your thoughts into obedience. So if you don't believe you have it, you, are, you, you literally don't have it. And what makes it worst as a saint, I believe, now this is opinion here, I'm just stating that this is my opinion, I believe that when Thomas doubted that Jesus resurrected, Jesus rebuked him for his doubt. And I believe that is tied into the fact that a saint that is an unbelief and an unbeliever that is an unbelief, it actually took different categories of unbelief. The unbeliever that does not have the Holy Spirit, his unbelief is one thing. But the saint that actually has unbelief is actually having unbelief with fortified by spirit power. Whatever you believe, you're going to release God power into it. And you can very well lock your life away from what God has freely given you in Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah, amen. And, and in that sense, we can literally walk in hell. Because we believe we can walk in hell. Yes, sir. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, oh, man. That's spot on. <laughs> spot on. All right. Okay, well, let's proceed. All right. So let's fall back in there. So we are, we just covered verse 4. Um, yes, John hath there being past tense. That's all. Oh, my. I did not see all. So he said, like Jesus said, those who don't acknowledge the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Uh -huh. Yes, please. 
Oh yes, 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 yes. I, I'm now seeing the yeses. Sorry about that. All right, so we're back at verse. We just covered that we are unblemished. So they, there are many in the Christian body that actually think that our righteousness are like filthy rags and all of that. That is untrue in the new covenant. Once Christ is in you, he has become you. You are unblemished and you are holy. Right? I will actually, we, we notice that holy is actually coming up a lot in, in, the, in, the Ephesians, in the Ephesians here. Very soon I am going to give, we are going to have basic identity too, hopefully be, by um, probably sometime uh, within the next week or, week or, week or two weeks. And um, I will, that session is de dedicated to holiness. So once we actually cover that, this holiness here in particular is going to make a lot more sense. Alright, so if anyone needs to leave, please. Yes. As John wrote, if anyone needs to needs to leave, I, we are not we are not obligated here at all. So please feel free. We do th as John put it, we do thank you for honoring us with your time. Uh, this is being recorded, so you can sue me. You're saying 7:05. Is that your time right now? Sorry, it's what is your time right now? It's 6:57 p.m. Okay, okay, all right. Well, I'm three hours three hours ahead of you. 9:57. All right, understood. I totally understand. All right, so we are in verse five. Verse five says he predestined and lovingly planned for us to be adopted to himself as his own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the good intention and pleasure of his will. Um, Dejan, could you please put up the definition of the word pleasure there, please? According to the Greek word that is actually eudokia. Pleasure. Eudokia. That means satisfaction. That is delight, kindness, wish, purpose. You can actually use just satisfaction and, and delight here. So the good pleasure of his will is the good satisfaction of his royal command. Father is very satisfied to have made us what he has made us in Christ, the spirit sons of God. Right? He pre yes, thank you, John. He predestined and loving plan for us to be adopted to himself. Well, in basic identity, one we would have covered how we were adopted as his own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the kind intention and good pleasure of his will. Verse 6. Can, every, can anyone read verse 6 and 7 for me, please? Anyone who hasn't read before. Verse 6 and 7. I, I can. I can. Um, 6. To the praise of his glorious grace and favor, which he so freely bestowed on us in the beloved, that's his son, Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption, that is our deliverance and salvation through his blood, with uh, which paid the penalty for our sin and resulted in the forgiveness and complete pardon of our sin uh, in, a, in accordance with the riches of his grace. Very much, bro. All right, so you see, to the praise of his glorious grace, we covered what grace is, which is privilege, removal of liability, and favor, which he so freely bestowed on us in the beloved, the beloved there being his son, Jesus Christ, which is we are we are in Christ now, we are that we are that new spirit. In Him we have redemption. That is our deliverance and salvation through His blood. Redemption here. What does redemption mean in particular? What does redemption mean? Buy back. Yes, lovely. I love that to reclaim what is lost. Uh, so me, yes, but that to re the reclaiming. Of what is lost is you come at a price when something is, re is being re is re being redeemed. Courtney says to, to to be bought back. Lovely, lovely. Anybody else? Redemption, redemption. Something. What is redemption? To relieve. Technically, redemption. Adrian, can you please put re give the de the definition of redemption? Definitely. Right. So the Greek word redemption is actually a polutrosis. It means to ransom in. Full to ransom in full. Now this we can actually spend a lot of time just understanding that redemption, but I'm going to bring it down into one simple idea here. You now many many saints actually have the opinion and know we constantly confess that Christ has redeemed me. But redemption means to ransom in full. Definition of redemption in context with this in the Merriam-Webster dictionary is an exchange of something of value. Note it says an exchange for something of value. In the Old Testament, because man was, listen to this, in the Old Testament, because man was in Adam, the spirit of Adam, the spirit of God left Adam, the book of Ecclesiastes actually says, it actually equates those in Adam 
an animal. Let me say this again. The man without the Holy Spirit, the book of Ecclesiastes, quits animals. Through the law of Moses, what was sin ransomed with? What was sin sacrifice of what? Of animals. The blood of the animals. Now, if we know that the blood of the animals, just as the Bible says in the, in the Old Testament, that the blood is the life of the animal, and we know that this, what gives life is spirit, then we know that the spirit merges with blood. Does that make sense? And it's the circulation of the blood that keeps your body alive, which is pretty much, say, uh, Courtney, what I was actually saying is that if the Old Testament says that the blood is the life of the animal, and if we know that life is the nature of an organism, and the, the organism is the spirit, then we comfortably understand and deduct that what um, the spirit of the animal, or the spirit of man in, in Adam, even now, is actually merged in the blood. So, what if Ecclesiastes, if Ecclesiastes equates those in Adam with animals, with a, it's no, they actually equate it with an animal, he says there's no difference between man and the animal. Let's just bring it into perspective. In the sacrificial system in the law of Moses, what was sacrificed to redeem the sin of men before Jesus came? What was sacrificed? Wasn't, wasn't it the animal that was sacrificed? Yes, that's because man separate, according to Ecclesiastes, I'm saying this again, human, man, separate from the spirit of God, is reduced pretty much and equated by King Solomon as an as equated with animals. So what actually cover the sins of men without the Holy Spirit? The spirit of the blood, which is the spirit of the animal. In Christ, what did Jesus do to actually bring us back into sonship? He sacrificed himself. And himself, in this case, is the word of God. So then what does sonship what did sonship require to as the ransom to restore what was sorry what did sonship require as the ransom the sacrifice of god himself in flesh does that make sense so the ransom is very high it is actually the dearest thing in the kingdom for, for, for Jesus to actually, or Father to actually restore us to sonship. It required that the Son, the Son of God, sacrifice himself. What I'm trying to actually bring to light here is the dearest, the, the dearness, the value of the ransom indicates the value of the, of the being, of the sonship. Does that make sense? So Jesus sacrificing is not a light matter. It is the word of God made flesh that sacrificed himself. The Bible actually says in, 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 in the Gospels that it is that it is um that God was in Christ dying on the cross, which means that the, the ransom was God himself. It could not be an animal. The animal was used to ransom those that were not in union with the Holy Spirit, which were, which was equivalent to the spirit of Adam, without the Holy Spirit being equivalent to animal. What ransomed their sin was the spirit, the blood, which is the spirit of the animal. For Christ, for God to restore us to sonship, God had to put himself and be the ransom to restore us to sonship. Which technically brings us down to the simple fact that as sons of God, we are no longer what we call humans. We are sons of God. We are the race of God. Does that make sense? Yeah? Lovely. Nicely. So the, the redemption in itself speaks a lot. The ransom that was paid speaks a lot about the being that it, that it ransomed, that it redeemed. Everybody following that? So it is no, actually, to say, I will, I will be bold to say this, to say and to promulgate the fact or the, or, the, or the idea that you as a son of God is not sharing or that you are lesser of in existence is to disrespect the redemption by the blood of Jesus. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, Diana. Yeah, everybody following there. Lovely. So we can comfortably, we can, uh, we can actually comfortably state that Jesus' uh, blood actually made us God family. It is not blasphemous. It is the simple truth. We are God family. We are the race 
of Father God. She me says a lot, taking not takes me a long time. Okay, no problem, no problem. All right, so that was redemption. Um, so we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness and complete pardon of our sin. What is forgiveness? Adrian, can you please post forgiveness there for me, please? The, the full definition. Nice. Many of us think actually forgiveness is just, hey, I forgive you. That we take it lightly. But forgiveness here actually is the Greek word aphesis. That means freedom and pardon. The word forgive in the contextual application means to give up resentment of or claim to requital, to grant relief from payment of. Let's say that again. To give up resentment of, to give up resentment of or claim to requital, to grant relief from payment of. So when Father has forgiven us, we were freed from the payment of our sinful nature and given the privilege in the kingdom, freedom of life from all liability, to become sons. And also, the definition also says to, to cease to feel resentment against. So does Father feel any form of resentment to us as his son? No. Um, for those of us who may have had religious backgrounds, that is something that most, most of us, well, most Christians with the religious, very religious background, they struggle with because they still, still sense tend to, to to approach Father with that fear, not the awe-filled fear, but the fear that they are lesser. If we take a look at the book of Revelation, authority or positions of authority given in the kingdom gives you the right to operate and to speak to Father in your authority. You would notice in, in Revelation 9 and 10, that even the angels speak to Jesus and they tell him, cast down your sickle. They didn't say, um, Lord Jesus, um, you could cast down your sickle now, please. No, that's disrespectful to the position of authority. <laughs> because of the authority that they're given as sons of God, we are expected to, when it comes to, especially when it comes to kingdom matters, that we speak in our authority. It is freely given and Father expects that you speak in the authority that he gives you. Does that make sense? There is no timidity. Father does not, does not expect you to speak with timidity because he has no resentment against you. You speak with no fear because he has nothing. There is no judgment against you. You are blessed and he expects you to speak to him as if you are blessed. As if you are the, uh, the ruling authority of the entire kingdom. You speak to him boldly. This is why the Bible says that we can boldly access the Father through the Spirit. Does that make sense? That makes sense. All right, so we approach Father in boldness. The timidity is unbelief. Does that make sense? Lovely. So it is not it, it is not blasphemous to speak to Father with boldness. It, but it is disrespectful to the kingdom for you to actually negate your position of authority and speak to him. As if you have not. Right? So let's embrace that. Right? The, word, the word pardon there also means a release from the legal penalty, penalties of an offense. An official warrant of remission of penalty. What does the word remit mean? The Bible says that we come to Jesus for the remission of sins. What does the word remit mean? No. But the general didn't put that there, so, so don't panic. <laughs> What's the word remit? What does remission mean? Come on. Yes, to dissolve. To dissolve, to cancel. You hear that? The word remit means to dissolve or to cancel, to relieve from. Yes, to set free. So your sins are not kept in a box. For those of you who may be struggling with that, the Bible says that you come to Jesus for the remission of sins, which means that your sins have been dissolved, it has been cancelled. You come to Jesus, in other words, for the cancellation of your sins. They no longer exist. It disappeared and died with the old spirit, with the spirit of Adam. You are now in Christ. And throughout the kingdom, the entire kingdom sees you in the same light that they see Jesus in. Does that make sense? Nicely. All right. All right, riches. Now it says there, in verse 7, it says, listen very carefully, in accordance with the riches of his grace. What does the word riches there mean? What is riches referring to? Do you know that the Greek word for riches there actually is plutos? Adrian, can you put that riches there for me, please? 
riches plutus it means wealth according to strong's concordance that is literal money possession abundance richness and valuable bestowment i say that again riches of his grace we understood his grace to be freedom of life freedom from liability and the riches of his grace in speaking of his wealth which means to say the the, the financial wealth the abundance the prosperity that comes as a result of being free from all liability you have no curses in your life so it's actually is about see it there wealth that is literally money possessions or figuratively abundance richness especially valuable bestowment is that is, it, is this making sense to you all right all accessible in christ walking in your identity as this as 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 the son of god as the spirit of god right verse 8 so are we uh, there are there are many that actually struggle also with the idea of poverty so walk in christ one must be humble which is and they mistake humility to be um, poverty and financial depravity but according to this as you see in here, here in ephesians your position in the kingdom gives you great spiritual blessings and once we walk in that identity this is our reality we live in the heavenly realms verse 8 <coughs> it says which he lavished on us in all wisdom thank you john in all wisdom and understanding with practical insight now question what is wisdom do you know that the book of proverbs says that wisdom was the first thing that was created before all of creation how many know that and all of creation is actually was was um, was brought into being through wisdom how many know that wisdom according to the book of proverbs chapter 8 wisdom was created before all of creation nicely which and and read the rest of creation is actually came into existence through wisdom god used it like a let's say figuratively used it as a wand and created all things by the wand of wisdom so if we desire to understand the kingdom what should we see? wisdom exactly so what is wisdom now, the words wisdom knowledge and understanding frequently used in the book of proverbs which is all about wisdom which has no which is no coincidence that the entire book of proverbs is all about wisdom because the found the kingdom of god is founded upon wisdom which means to understand the, the laws of the kingdom of that spiritual kingdom is actually is to understand wisdom so what is the modern day words for wisdom what 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 modern day word do you think best describes wisdom the ability to think and act using knowledge experience understanding common sense and insight lovely john give me that in one word give me that definition in one word the ability to act and use knowledge what is that in our modern english think you always use it you use it more often than not and once you understand it the book of proverbs will become an open book to you what is the modern day english word for wisdom when we say that someone is wise what are we actually spent um yes but most people don't know that word. You're very on. You're very. You're very on, John. The property, the property of being sapient, the property of possessing or being able to possess. Give me one word, John. We use it very, very frequently. It's actually a, a synonym to smart, intelligent. That is the word I'm looking for. Intelligence. Knowledgeable. Uh, Linda said, knowledgeable. Knowledge and intelligence must not ever be, um, <laughs> must not ever be confused. Knowledge and intelligence even though they are related they are not the same right in um the modern day word for wisdom is actually intelligence what would we use in our modern day language for the word knowledge so wisdom is defined as the ability or the skill of using or applying knowledge understanding also is tied in linda but it is not the same they're all tied in one and the same you cannot actually it, it explains a, a, a sequence of events but understanding is not the same as wisdom or knowledge what is what is the modern day word for knowledge if wisdom is the ability of applying not data lovely yes diana that is information data so wisdom is actually the ability of applying knowledge which is the ability of applying information 
This is why Proverbs chapter 1, the cry of wisdom is for men to seek information. Because if you do not have, if you are not informed, your ability to apply information is limited to the, to the, to the information that you have. If you have no information, you would be the world of wisdom, but have nothing to exercise it with. Does that make sense? So the cry of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 1 is to seek knowledge. But King Solomon goes on to say, in all your seeking, seek understanding. So wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge, or knowledge is information, so the ability to apply information. But what is understanding? It is understanding that I provoke in all of these sessions. What is understanding? Knowing, be a little more specific, Linda. Mm, not learning, learning what? Diana, learning what? Ability to record, not really Elijah, that's actually memory. Establish, what is established, Linda? Reasoning, lovely John. Understanding is actually in, is actually in biblical context in the book of Proverbs is actually reasoning or knowing the mechanics, logical interpretation. Once you understand that, now do you understand why, as we actually, I am provoking your, in, your, your thought and your reasoning that you're actually making very intelligent deductions, even with respect to things like traveling in the spirit. Because according to, Sol King, to King Solomon, one must seek reasoning. The Holy Spirit is also referred to as the spirit of reasoning, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowing the mechanics. So guess what? When we begin to reason, what are we doing? Who are we engaging? If the spirit of God is the spirit of understanding, reasoning, knowing the mechanics, when we begin to reason, yes, Linda, we engage the Holy Spirit direct and all the answers naturally flow. Does that make sense? Yeah? So we say that again, wisdom, is intelligence, knowledge, information, the accumulation of facts, understanding, reason, and knowing the mechanics. So let me wrap up with this one other thought-provoking question. Who has made wisdom to us? Actually, two, 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 two thought-provoking questions. Who has made wisdom to us? According to, 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 to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Jesus. Lovely. Christ has made wisdom to us and the power of God. So now let's journey back to the, um, the narrative in Genesis chapter 1. In well, ch chapter 1 into chapter 2, when God told Adam to what, what was the name of the tree that God told Adam to not eat of? The tree of what of good and evil? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, let's interchange that. It says the tree of the information or the facts of good and evil. Who did King Solomon say is the beginning of wisdom? Or should I say, what did King Solomon say was the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. Lovely. So when we understand that with God is wisdom, which is defined as the knowledge, sorry, the ability to apply information, to apply knowledge. So when Adam chose to eat, when, when he was told that he could eat of all the trees, and the tree was actually a tree of life, we know that life is an attribute of God, right? Good. And if with God is wisdom, when Adam chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, did Adam have wisdom? No, he did not. Therefore, we understand why the entire earth in choosing knowledge. Uh, why, Diana? That is because wisdom is with God. The tree of life is actually God. So to choose the knowledge is actually to choose information without the ability to apply the knowledge. This is why... King Solomon says that all men are wise in their own conceit. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, speaks about those in, in Greece, the philosophers, and he says that they are the wisdom of men is the foolishness of God in the, in the context of, 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 of chapter. The foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of men. That is because through the, choosing the knowledge of good and evil, you have information without the ability to apply it. Does that make sense? Because with God is wisdom. With God is the ability to apply the knowledge. So his choice to choose the knowledge of good and evil was to choose information without the faculty, the ability to apply it. Does that make sense? The book of Proverbs says that wisdom, <laughs> the book of Proverbs says with wisdom, it is intelligence, 
Yes, John. Yes. But that is not kids, John. That is actually the spirit of Adam. The spirit of, of Adam naturally is not intelligent. They actually don't know how to apply knowledge. That's because Adam, in choosing knowledge of good and evil, he chose information and intelligence left him. That is why those in Adam cannot understand the spirit of God, nor understand the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? That's because they fill their minds with information. They will study and fill their minds with information. No, John, Adam chose info, which is knowledge, but he did not choose intelligence, which is the ability to apply the knowledge. So those in Adam are clueless with respect to the kingdom. This is why in Proverbs, the whole book of Proverbs actually emphasizes that man, those, with his, those in Adam, are wise in their own conceit. They are wise in their own minds because intelligence really is with God. And because they do not have God, they are not intelligent. They, be, they believe themselves to be intelligent. Does that make sense? So how can one have wisdom without the knowledge to apply that wisdom to? How the, how, wait, hold on. Tammy says, so how can one have wisdom without the knowledge to apply that wisdom to? Well, that is actually the fate of Adam, unfortunately, Tammy. He chose knowledge and lost the intelligence, which was the ability to apply the knowledge. King Solomon actually goes into great depth to show that man they are wise in their own minds because they believe that the accumulation of knowledge makes them wise. Only when they come into Christ and they receive the spirit of Christ is the intelligence restored to them. So we sons of God could, uh, could actually understand the kingdom whilst they cannot. Even Paul goes into a long discourse as to those in Greece, the philosophers, who are filled with pieces of data, but because they do not have the Holy Spirit, which is the intelligence, the ability to apply the knowledge, they wander off into many theories. That's because they have no reference point. They don't have the ability to apply the knowledge that they are, the data that they are accumulating by studying it here. Does this make sense? Does this make sense at all? Hey, yes. Zane. Um, so if Adam, are you saying Adam had wisdom until he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and then he lost the wisdom? God. Yes, that is exactly it. Okay, so my question is, if he had wisdom but no knowledge, then what was he applying that wisdom to? Adam, the wisdom, yes. If he had wisdom without knowledge, what is he applying wisdom to? Well, That's yeah. right, because from what I understand you're saying is you need the knowledge to apply the wisdom to... <laughs> so I'm confused. <laughs> All right, so, well, the Holy Spirit, remember the Holy Spirit is, all, is the Spirit of God. So when you receive the Holy Spirit, you don't only receive the ability to apply knowledge, but Paul also says that you have no need of a teacher, that the Holy Spirit is a teacher, which means to say, with wisdom, the Holy Spirit is naturally, it naturally begins to be imparted to you. To separate yourself from the Holy Spirit is to separate yourself from wisdom and the, and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, which is intelligence, but also very knowledgeable. So you separate yourself from the Holy Spirit, you lose wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Choosing the knowledge of good and evil puts him in a position where he has to go and acquire the information on his own without the ability to apply it in its proper context. Does that make sense, Tommy? <clears throat> yes, that's a lot clearer. Thank you. All right. Lovely. So when Christ now has made is made wisdom to you what does that mean to you now I ask it, i'm asking again if christ now has made wisdom to you what does that mean now what does that mean courtney says all of it wisdom and understanding right so what we have now is the intelligence of god we are shadow, we are shadow of christ well not we are multiplication of christ then it's been more accurate to say that we are multiplication of the word of god we are one spirit so what we have is that we are now reinstated to be able to take all information and apply it in a proper context. And once we begin to reason the information, because we have the intelligence of God, we will be able to actually understand the mechanics of the kingdom and all things around us. Does that make sense? Yes, John, we walk in his wisdom. We are the wisdom of God now. We have the intelligence of the ability to apply knowledge of the ability of God. 
to apply the, the, the information. So once we begin to reason, which is Holy Spirit again, Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom, it's the spirit of knowledge, it's the spirit of understanding. So once we have God, we have all things. So the more you learn, the more the Holy Spirit actually gives you the proper context. This is why I personally believe that once the scenes begin to settle into this, we would be able to tell the scientists and the astronomists what it really is once the scenes begin to, up, to, 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 to settle into this and accept it as their reality. The of Jesus in us is to operate from the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, and understanding of the body because Jesus is God. Yes, sir. So Christ has now been re restored and you now have God intelligence. That's why you have the mind of Christ. You have the intelligence of Christ. His ability to apply knowledge in its proper context and understand the king. Does that make sense? All right. Lovely. So, we shall pause there tonight. Do we have any, um, before we, before we, before we wrap up, would anyone like to, to, to um, unmute and just any thoughts before we pray ourselves out? Comment. This was really deep. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's some good stuff to chew on. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that is what we're here for, man. Lessons, my dear sister. Anybody else? It's on mute. Thoughts, comments. Uh, we will we will resume on Thursday, same time. Anybody else? Feel free. Well, what I do like though is that everybody is asking questions, and they're and it's not just general questions. It's it's thought provoking questions. Indeed. And yes. uh, that's that's really cool. And, uh, yeah. Wow. This is incredible. <laughs> so I Actually, I actually love that I, just so everyone know, I actually, when I usually engage sessions like this, I mean, preaching is good, and we have a lot of that in the world. But Paul, if you read Acts 28, it says actually Paul preached the kingdom and taught the things concerning Jesus Christ. So, and when in teaching, you to teach without opening up the floor to ask questions is not to teach at all. So I am. I am actually. I am. Very, I, it makes me happy to see that person is actually asking questions and the, the intelligence behind the questions. This the, the, the session is serving its purpose. I give glory to God for that. We are we are actually engaging the spirit of understanding, and He is bringing the revelations to you. All right. So it's now. I think it's time to wrap up, and we will continue on Thursday.